morning, everyone. Good morning. So glad to be with you this morning. Um, I appreciate the invite. Um, I always love to join forces with anyone that's doing great work in the area of special education. Um, just a little bit, snippet more about me. I actually came into special education because about 22 years ago, I gave birth as a young parent to a kid with severe disabilities. At that time, they called it a chemical imbalance, uh, later diagnosed as ADHD. Um, so I can definitely relate to going to the doctor numerous times and being told, oh, they're going to outgrow it. Um, it's just a colicky baby. Um, but most of the time, parents know. Um, so I think I was the first person to identify that this kid had some um, challenges that were outside of the norm. And so that's what drove me into studying more about special education. Um, so I'm glad to be with you this morning because I'm very passionate about helping kids with disabilities to be the best that they could be. And that is what we're all here for. So here's our schedule for today again. Um, I'll be presenting shortly and then we'll have a break and then we'll do a uh, part two. So today is a very special day. This is a picture of Rachel, and this is Dr. LaBarbara's daughter, and she is expecting her baby today. So let's, throughout the evening, let's keep um, Rachel in prayer because we want a healthy baby. We want a safe delivery, a fast, safe delivery. Um, so let's keep Rachel in prayer today and, you know, cheer, cheer her on. So congratulations, Dr. LaBarbara. So today we're going to be looking at the, the, the what, the why, and the how of autism spectrum disorders. Um, it's important to know what, what behaviors to look for. So we'll look at the, what are the characteristics associated with autism spectrum. Um, we'll look at why. Why do students have behaviors or children have behaviors? Because there's always a why to a behavior. Um, Whenever a child is acting out or um, experiencing some kind of conflict with the environment, either externally or internally, it's usually for a reason. And then we'll look at how, how we can um, support the students and kind of help them to uh, learn new behaviors that might be more appropriate. And then how we can support you also in your role um, in dealing with families and, and children that are experiencing autism characteristics. So the first thing that we'll look at is really understanding the purpose of the behavior. Um, so we know that all behavior has a function. It's the behavior is trying to do something to either get something or to communicate something. And so a part of this lecture is about why the behavior, what the behavior is about. Okay. So take for a, a moment and just think about a child that you might know that is on the autism spectrum or any child that you know, well, all children experience behavior challenges, right? So think about a situation where you saw a child and they looked like they were having challenging behavior. What kinds of actions did you see? Okay, someone said hitting themselves in the head. Anything else? Screaming, covering their ears. No eye contact, okay? What, what did you feel when you saw those behaviors? Oh, I heard frustration quite a bit. <laughs> Anything else? What were the feelings that when you, when you are observing someone having challenging behavior, what are you feeling? Helpless, okay? So if you look at this picture, what do you see? <laughs> Someone said my son. <laughs> so what's going on here? OK. So on the surface, you have a kid that's obviously having a tantrum, possibly kicking, crying, yelling. Okay. 
So most of us, or the general population, if we were to see a kid in a store doing this or on a playground, we would probably come to some conclusion that they were just having a meltdown, maybe couldn't get their way. You know, maybe they were hungry, didn't take a nap that day. Um, but in this case, it's actually a little boy that's on the spectrum who was trying to communicate that he needed to use the restroom. And so the way that he uh, decided to communicate that he needed to use the restroom was to walk in that direction. Well, there's a yard monitor that wasn't sure about his intentions and what he was trying to communicate. So she went to stop him from getting his needs met because she thought he was going to run away. So maybe he had a pattern of running. Um, and so there was a communication conflict here, communication breakdown between the student or the child having their needs met and the, per the adults in the surrounding area understanding what the behavior was. So this was the end result. It was a tantrum because they couldn't get their needs met. And so just imagine for a moment the role of communication in functioning in society. So just think for a second. You're at a, you've been at an all-day training. You've had two breaks, and you're just tired. What are some of the things you might want to do to get your needs met? Some may want to take a nap. I'm sure you might have to visit the, the ladies and gentlemen's room. Some people will want quietness. But as adults, because we can communicate, we can probably excuse ourselves if we need to, you know, raise our finger and tiptoe out. Um, we can tell someone that we'll be right back. Uh, we can leave early if we want to, right? Because we pretty much have control over our settings and can communicate that way. But just imagine if you had to use the restroom and you couldn't communicate it. And someone else, an adult, was in charge of you having the ability to actually go to the restroom or not and think about what your response may be. Might be frustration. We might have a temper tantrum, right? Adult temper tantrum. So it's about learning what the function of the behavior is. So that's what our lecture is about today. So in this case, the child needed to have a, a need met and wasn't able to articulate it the way that we normally would. So what are some of the common behaviors uh, that students with ASD, ASD experience. And then we're going to look at why these behaviors occur and how we can guide the students more. So these are some common behaviors. Um, raise your hand if you've seen uh, students with ASD self-stimming. Okay, um, And we'll talk at, about what self-stimming is, what it looks like, and what we can do about it. Um, what about a obsessive behavior? Okay, and then tantrums, right? We have normal developing children that experience tantrums, right, and adults that experience tantrums. Um, so we'll look at how it's similar and how it's different, because it is a little different in students with ASD, uh, because one of the areas is we can't tell why they're tantruming, right, and we'll talk about that more. So self-stemming behaviors is pretty typical in kids with, on the autism spectrum. Um, there's something going on in the child's brain where they're being overwhelmed by some stimuli. So stimuli meaning something in the environment is causing their brain to be overwhelmed and self-stimming is one of the ways that they kind of compensate for it or cope with it. Okay, And we all have different coping me mechanisms that we use, right? So if I'm sitting at a table for a long time and I'm not a very patient person. My blood just works differently than, say, my husband, who could sit for like 20 hours and just be like. <laughs> so I'm the type of person, after 20 minutes, my coping mechanism has to be to shake my leg. I'm going to have to start doodling. So for some students with autism spectrum, self-stemming is a coping mechanism just to help soothe them, to calm their brain, and to kind of get through the situation. Now, sometimes the self-stemming um, may be to get out of something. And we'll talk about the purposes for behavior a little bit more later. But it's very normal for students on the autism spectrum. So 
So here are some typical stemming activities that we see, right? Do you, any of you have any that you don't see up there? Okay. So hands over the ears, someone described earlier, making vocal sounds, right? Rocking, okay. Repetitious behavior, right? Pretty typical. So what we heard was a need for security. We heard a child trying to exhibit some sort of control over what they were feeling or over their environment in that moment. And we talked about earlier about how most people, especially adults, have lots of control over our environment. And even if we have physical responses to something, there are things we can do to cope that are usually a little more socially acceptable than stemming. But in any case, maybe we wouldn't want to interfere with stemming unless it was self-injurious kinds of behavior. Um, and then maybe as we're teaching, we can help to teach stemming behavior. Maybe that is more socially acceptable, right? Um, just like I would my normal developing daughter who can't sit for more than 20 minutes in class. Well, it's socially acceptable for you to sit there and just shake your leg as opposed to maybe tapping on the desk. So it's the same kind of, of concept, right? Teaching more socially acceptable behaviors um, and really understanding what the purpose is of the self-stimulation and understanding that it's something happening in their brain that they can't control. They're not trying to be purposefully annoying or irritating, right? And so that helps a lot. So now we'll look at obsessions. So obsession, um, this is one of the basic diagnostic definitions of a kid on the autism spectrum or a person on the autism um, spectrum. Um, sometimes they become very um, obsessed um, with trains and alphabets and numbers and historical events, um, songs. Um, it could be a number of things. Uh, but the key is that it's an obset obsession, something they've really honed in on, and they're really not interested in too much of anything else, OK? They like, obs they like rituals, OK? And I guess the defining factor between someone liking something a lot and someone being obsessed with it would be the frequency and the intensity. And again, in, in this situation, we're talking about obsession where um, it's preventing other things from being done that need to be done in a, a day's time. So you're obsessed with singing the alphabet, so you can't break for a moment to ask to go to the restroom when you need to, or to let me know that you're hungry. So it's, it's impeding and it's, it's not being able to facilitate some other things in life that need to get done. So that's when we would call it an obsession, okay? Um, routine, it says, is a means by which they understand and feel safe. So we know that students with as, um, autism, on the autism spectrum, really do well in routine situations. They love predictability. They like to know what's happening, first, second, and last. Um, so what that looks like to me, I'm thinking about um, a preschool classroom, and I'm picturing, um, I'm picturing a visual schedule, right? So it has a picture of them coming in in the morning and they're having free play. But there's a picture of the kids having free choice. Then there's a picture that lets them know, okay, we're going to transition later to, say, circle time. But there's visual reminders, so there's a predictable routine for students. And that makes them feel very safe. Um, and when there's a change in a the routine, there needs to be some type of transition support activity. Um, and transition is any time that you're moving from one thing to another, right? Because these students tend to be obsessed and they tend to have repetitive behavior. So routines are important and it's very important to communicate in as many ways as possible when there's a change in a routine. Okay, how many of you are familiar with uh, brain gymnastics? Okay, so brain gymnastics comes out of the study of kinesiology. And it's uh, a bunch of movements, and they kind of 
do scans of the brain to see what parts of the brain are stimulated during certain movements. A lot of the movements in actuality look like exercises. If you played basketball, then you know about lunges, right? Pretty typical. So there's different movements. So it says, you know, a lunge stimulates like the reading part of the brain, that kind of thing. Well, brain gymnastics could be something that you could use that's easy as a transition support for students. So say you have a routine going and you have your visual schedule. Say something happens, like it always does, and you have to break the routine. Um, sometimes you can implement a transition activity in there. Uh, a simple one is having a student stand up with their hands on their hips and kind of making like a crazy eight. And so they know every time they do this transition activity that they're going to a specific different activity that might be a break in their routine. So it just signals to their brain, we're doing something different right now. And it just gives them a little more support. But there's a bunch of things you can use as transition supports. Um, sometimes they're finger snaps or rhythm. Sometimes it's a short song. But the key is to use the same activity for the same transition all the time so that you let their brain know what's coming next because they like routine and predictability. And then we have the infamous tantrums. Yay. So it's a common problem in any child. Anyone who works with children knows that tantrums are a, part, a natural part of the territory. Um, well, students with Asperger's, it might be a little more frequent and it might be a little more intense, again, because sometimes we can find out why other kids are having tantrums, right? So the normal child um, in the grocery store who falls on the ground and has a tantrum, we may say, well, why are you crying? And they may be able to answer us, I'm hungry or I want all the chips <laughs> right there, and I want it now. But they can communicate so we at least know the why and then we can respond. We can respond with absolutely not, <laughs> or okay, you're tired, let's go home. So with our students that have communication challenges, um, like students with autism spectrum, it's a little more difficult to find out why they're tantruming and to support them in getting their needs met um, to help them with whatever the function is of the behavior, okay? So it's a little more challenging. So we'll look at some interventions. Um, anything that you can do to increase a child's ability to communicate, for them to be able to tell you what needs they're trying to have met. Again, I would say visual, um, Visual calendars, uh, communication boards, right? Pictures of, let's say if they're in a school setting, there's pictures of everything that's gonna happen in the day. Um, and helping the student to have the ability to be able to point to or say one word sentences, whatever their communication abilities are. Um, just giving them all the mechanisms to be able to tell you and the staff or other students what they, what they need or what they're experiencing at the time, whether that's pictures of feelings, whether that's pictures of snack or the restroom or, you know, I need a nap, um, increasing their ability basically to communicate with you. That might be teaching gestures. I know in some settings we're teaching students sign language, right? Um, so anything to increase their ability to express to us what they need, okay? Because remember, the behavior has a function. They're trying to have a need met. Or they're trying to get out of something. They're trying to escape something, right? And we can find that out from communication too, right? OK, so uh, and another thing is um, just going back to the why of the behavior. Um, there's a saying in education that if kids could do better, they probably would do better. So most of the time, um, it's not that they don't want to participate and collaborate. Um, sometimes they just don't have the skills to. Um, and so we're here to support them in, in that way. All right, so let's just kind of review um, with our neighbor the what of a behavior. 
So what do we what do we think the the what? What kind of behaviors can we kind of expect from students with autism spectrum? Just turn to one or two people at your table and talk about the what. What does ASD look like as far as behaviors in most of our children? Okay. Great discussions. So is there a table that would like to share what they came up with as the what? What are we what types of behaviors can we expect from most students with on the autism spectrum? Screaming? Okay, frustration when their routine is broken, which may result in self-stemming or tantrum. Okay, being stuck, she said. Not able to transition with the rest of the day or expectations for the rest of the day. Inability to communicate clearly. Okay, what do you mean by lack of awareness? Body awareness? Okay. So lack of body awareness, she said. So sometimes they can't read social cues from other kids or they don't know what's socially acceptable or not. I think I just read a startling statistic that in one state, um, an increasing population of sexual offenders are Asperger's. Um, people with Asperger's, young men with Asperger's, not knowing socially limits and what's socially acceptable, what's dating versus being obsessed and stalking, basically. Um, what other? What about hide hiding? Under the hiding. Uh, okay. Hiding. <laughs> Looking for safety, huh? Sounds like hiding. Okay. Anything else? Okay, good. So they're expressing that they're out of control, but they're actually expressing it in a way where they're trying to gain control. That's what she said, okay. All right, so now we're gonna look at the why. So why do these behaviors occur? Every behavior occurs for a reason. Either it was prompted by something or there's some kind of need that's attempting to be met, okay? Um, in this case, it's usually one of four things. Um, they're trying to gain access to something, right? A restroom, snack. Um, maybe they wanna play with a child and can't express it. Um, attention might be one of the, the needs that needs to be met. Um, it could be to escape something. Maybe there's a task that's too difficult for them. Maybe what's being asked of them, if it's academics, um, it's beyond their skill level and they can't express that it's too difficult. Um, maybe it's something functional that they're being requested to do, like zip up their pants or tie shoes, um, and they know that it's expected but don't have the skills to do it. And so maybe the the behavior, tantruming, self-stemming, is to get out of having to do that skill that they feel like they can't meet. Um, and then sometimes the behavior is because they enjoy the feeling that they get, maybe from self-stemming. So just like maybe me rocking my leg is comforting to me, or you know, having a great piece of dark chocolate is comforting to me, maybe whatever behaviors there, the hand flapping, the, the echolalia, maybe all of that is comforting to them, makes them feel a sense of control in their environment, okay? So those would be the four reasons, access to something tangible, attention, escape, right? Trying to get out of something or some situation, um, or they enjoy the feeling, okay? So in these situations, we look at how can we rely more on structure and how can we increase their communication, 
And then how can we also be aware of their sensory processing issues that are going on? And we'll talk a little bit more about sensory processing types of things. But these may be some of the triggers, we call them, um, for some of the challenging behaviors that we see. So like we talked about earlier, um, students on the autism spectrum really like structure and predictability. It's very important. And so how can we increase predictability and routine and um, the student's ability to, com to communicate um, what they need or what they're experiencing. So those are things that we should look for to help decrease some of the tantrums. Um, another thing, idea is what we pay attention to grows in a lot of situations. So even with our students with Asperger's uh, disorder, um, I know it's really kind of nat natural um, to have all of our attention to go to anything negative. And it's, it takes some training to actually give a little more attention to things that are positive. So when you catch that student not self-stemming for five seconds, is there any way to positively reinforce that? Is there any way to, since you know they have some things that they want, that they're trying to get access to stickers or goldfish crackers. So when you do catch them doing some more socially acceptable things, is that a great time to insert maybe some of the things that they want or need. So that's a way to. So as we know, um, for uh, people with communication difficulties, um, so not only are they having issues with understanding expectations, right? We call that receptive language. So understanding what's being asked of them. So sometimes we assume that students understand what the expectation is because they've been in my home for 10 years or they've been coming to school here for five years. They know the routine. Um, but sometimes the receptive language of what's expected and what is being asked is not working normally as it would with others, other children. So we have to be very clear on ways to increase the communication so they understand what it is that we expect in that setting at that moment from them and help support that. Um, the other thing is expressive language, right? What we talked about earlier, being able to communicate, I'm uncomfortable, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hungry. Um, this is too difficult. So they have issues with both of those areas of, of language. And it's just looking for practical ways to support students and uh, bringing up their skills in those areas. And for some, it's going to be very basic, like using uh, communication cards. Others, it's going to be teaching them gestures and cues. Others, you're going to actually be teaching them language, just depending on what their abilities are or not. Okay. And then this is important. Sometimes we can accidentally reinforce behavior that we don't want to reinforce, right? So a typical example is you have a, a student um, with Asperger's who is tantruming, and the why is they want goldfish. So every time they tantrum, though, they've trained everyone in the environment to give them goldfish to get off the ground. So we've kind of positively reinforced that Yes, you can have goldfish once you engage in tantruming. And we'll talk later about how to help them devise a different plan for getting goldfish. You don't have to tantrum to get goldfish. So it's, re, it's us being retaught, because actually the most challenging thing about challenging behavior is changing the adult's behavior <laughs> in the environment, not necessarily the kids, because they've trained us to do some things that Maybe we should do a little differently. So that's why you have to know what the why is of the behavior. Because if you don't know what the why is of the behavior, you'll think that you're, you're negatively reinforcing it or you have consequences in place to get rid of it when actually you're serving the purpose of their behavior. So it's, that's why it's, it'll be good to be very clear. Um, some ways you can be very clear about the why are ABC, how many of you do ABC forms? 
You look at the antecedent, what happened before. You look at the behavior, right? What exactly is happening with the behavior? Not, um, she's being very frustrated. It's, she fell on the ground and kicked, she has her legs kicking in the air. And then you identify what the consequences are. And when you identify what the consequences are, actually, I think you should add an R. It should be A, B, C, R. Antecedent, you look at the behavior, you look at the consequences, and how did they respond to the consequences? Because how they responded to the consequences will tell you if that's a consequence you want to use in the future or not. Because that will tell you if you reinforce the behavior or you help to make the behavior extinct. Okay? These are some other things that go on with sensory processing. I know a lot of kids with autism are actually getting therapy where they're just doing sensory stimulation. Right? They're just working with the therapist for a few moments, just touching different textures. Like this jacket would probably drive some people, you know, just over the edge. And so a part of their therapy would be just to touch things like this. Um, noises, different smells, all of these can be triggers for some of the obsession, some of the self-stimulation, um, self-injurious behavior as well. Um, and the tantrums. So it might be overstimulation. So this would, this would be good in knowing the antecedent, right? A, B, C. What's the antecedent? Well, we just served him um, green peas again. And we noticed he threw everything off the table and had a tantrum, right? That's the behavior. So what was the consequence? Did we take the peas away or did we offer something else? But it'll give us some insight into to what's going on. But it might be some of the sensory things, the lighting, the smells, the noises. All of those could be possible triggers for any of the behaviors. And I almost forgot, um, so, subtle changes. For students with um, autism, they're not very subtle. They're actually very prominent for them. So little things that break the routine and the predictability. So again, we know in life, life is unpredictable, right? We have to have breaks in routines and sometimes things aren't predictable, but it's really, if you know that's gonna happen, it's pre-planning. How can you support their communication in that situation and how can you give them lots of forewarning and prepare them for that, that transition? So going back to the picture that we saw earlier, uh, what would you say would be the function of this behavior? You think it's reliance on structure? You think it's communication need or sensory processing? So if you think it's A, put up one finger. If you think it's B, put up two, C, three. Okay, so most everyone said a communication need, okay? And so like we said earlier, the student needed to communicate that he had to have a need met and he wasn't able to get that need met, okay? So when you find yourself in situations as a parent or as a teacher or caregiver, um, and as a student is experiencing obsessive behavior, self-stemming, tantrums. So the question you want to ask yourself is, what are they trying to tell me with this behavior? What's the function of the behavior? Okay. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. So they may be saying that they want to do a specific activity they may be saying they want to play. They may be saying they need a break. They may be saying something's too easy or too difficult. We have very highly intelligent students that are on the, the autism spectrum um, that maybe aren't being challenged enough, or uh, maybe it's something overstimulating in the environment that's causing them not to be able to actually complete, let's say, an algebra problem because other things in the environment are just too over 
overwhelming for them. So it's not that they can't do the task at all. Maybe they're trying to escape some other things in the environment. Okay, so um, we talked earlier, the way that we respond to um, the behavior can either reinforce it and keep the behavior going, or sometimes we can make the behavior less frequent depending on how we respond to it. Um, but it takes, it takes some time. Challenging behavior isn't something that changes overnight. Challenging behavior is very draining. It's very emotional. Um, and so challenging behavior is something you really have to sit down and put a strategic plan together about why is the behavior happening and how can we teach other skills so that the, the child can have their needs met, okay? So these are the two terms, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So positive reinforcement, it gets a person something that they want, right? So whatever the function was of the behavior, whether that was to get out of something or to get something, um, it's positively reinforced when they get what they want, basically. Um, negative reinforcement is when we get a person out of something or away from something. So it's decreasing. So negative reinforcement would mean every time we applied that consequence, remember A, B, C, every time we applied that consequence, then we saw the behavior decrease, okay? So that could be some, some sign for you. If the behavior continues, maybe the consequences or the things that we are applying are actually reinforcing it as, a, as opposed to um, decreasing it. Any questions or comments so far about that positive and negative reinforcement? Okay. So let's read the following statement. So this is about screaming. We have Timmy. He doesn't want to eat carrots, but his parents keep trying to get him to eat them. At dinner time, if there are any carrots on his plate, he will scream and shout until they're taken off his plate. His parents always give in to the tantrums and take away the carrots because his tantrums are becoming increasingly, increasingly severe and last longer. So tell a neighbor, what do you think? Is this positive or negative reinforcement? Okay, so what do you all think? Raise your hand if you think it's positive reinforcement. So remember, positive means that we maintain the behavior. So positive reinforcement of what behavior? What behavior are we talking about? The tantrum, right, or screaming? So how many think it's negative reinforcement? Okay. So why do you think it's negative reinforcement? Okay. All right. So we'll talk more after the break about positive and negative reinforcement and what we can do to address some of the challenging behaviors we're experiencing. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.